Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, Hubble observes the most distant galaxy ever seen, the twin black holes observed by LIGO may have come from the same star, and ESA's ExoMars mission prepares to launch later this month. Astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have announced that they have observed and confirmed the most distant galaxy ever detected. By pushing Hubble to its limits, an international team has shattered the cosmic distance record by measuring the farthest galaxy ever seen in the universe. This surprisingly bright infant galaxy named GNZ11 is seen as it was 13.4 billion years in the past, just 400 million years after the Big Bang. Now, this galaxy is located in the direction of the constellation Ursa Major. With this observation, astronomers are closing in on the first galaxies that formed in the universe and take astronomers into a realm that was once thought to be only reachable with NASA's upcoming James Webb Space Telescope. This measurement provides strong evidence that some unusual and unexpectedly bright galaxies found earlier in Hubble images are really at extraordinary distances. Previously, the team had estimated this galaxy, GNZ11's distance, by determining its color through imaging with Hubble and the Spitzer Space Telescope. Now, this method of using filters to estimate distance is called photometric redshift. But now, for the first time for a galaxy at such an extreme distance, the team used Hubble's Wide Field Camera 3, also called WIFC3, to precisely measure the distance to GNZ11 spectroscopically by splitting the light into its component colors. This spectroscopic redshift is a much more accurate and definitive measurement for determining distance. The problem is it requires more light to make and these very distant galaxies are barely within Hubble's vision. But GNZ11 is unusually bright for a galaxy so far away and the WIFC3 spectrograph was able to make the measurement. Now for those of you who don't know, astronomers measure large distances by determining the redshift of a galaxy. Now this redshift phenomenon is a direct result of the expansion of the universe. Every distant object in the universe appears to be going away from us because its light is stretched to longer and redder wavelengths as it travels through expanding space to reach our telescopes. The greater the redshift, the farther away the galaxy is. Now astronomers say after re-looking at this galaxy again and getting the spectroscopic observations that the galaxy is even further away than they had originally thought. It's right at the distance limit of what Hubble can observe. In the past, using the photometric redshift observations, astronomers determined the distance for GNZ11 that it had a redshift of about 8.68, which puts it at about 13.2 billion years in the past. But now, with the spectroscopic observations, the team has confirmed that it actually has a redshift of 11.1, nearly 200 million years closer to the time of the Big Bang, and that shatters all previous record holders. So what's this galaxy like, and why is it so bright? Well, these observations show a very young and hot galaxy, creating stars at a furious rate. The combination of Hubble and Spitzer imaging reveals that GNZ11 is 25 times smaller than the Milky Way and has just 1% of our galaxy's mass in stars. But this newborn galaxy is also growing very fast, and it's forming stars at a rate about 20 times greater than our galaxy does today. This star formation rate allows this extremely remote galaxy to be bright enough for astronomers to find and perform these detailed observations with both Hubble and Spitzer. This was kind of an unexpected thing to see from such a distant galaxy, and these results reveal surprising new clues about the nature of the very early universe. It was surprising to see that a galaxy so massive existed only 200 to 300 million years after the very first star started to form. Now astronomers are saying that these findings provide a tantalizing preview of the observations that the James Webb Space Telescope will perform after it is launched in 2018. So Hubble and Spitzer are already reaching into Webb territory, and this new discovery shows that the JWST will almost certainly find many such young galaxies reaching back to when the first galaxies were forming. <laughs> and I will let you know. Next, remember a couple of weeks ago I told you about the discovery of gravitational waves and that the source of those waves were created from the merging of two stellar-sized black holes? Well, astronomers are now saying that it's possible that these two black holes were formed from within the same star. Now, a lot of people might think that when two black holes merge, that the event would be a dark one, right? I mean, if two black things that emit no light of their own collide, well, then the resulting collision would also be dark, right? Well, it turns out that's not always true. 
observations from the Fermi Space Telescope, which is a gamma ray telescope, detected a gamma ray burst just a fraction of a second after LIGO's famous signal detection. Now, having this bright event occur immediately after the gravitational wave event suggests that the two black holes might have resided inside a single massive star whose death generated the gamma ray burst. Now normally, and we've talked about this a lot on SFN, when a very massive star reaches the end of its life, its core collapses into a single black hole. Usually. <laughs> but if the star was spinning very rapidly as it collapsed, its core might stretch into a dumbbell shape and fragment into two clumps, each forming its own black hole. That's my black hole dance. So how can this happen? Well, to start, you need a very massive star that's spinning really fast. And to get that spin, it usually means you start with two smaller stars revolving around each other. So as they revolve around each other, they go faster and faster, and they spiral together, and the resulting merged star would still be spinning after it's all over. And it'd be spinning really fast. So after that, after the spinning star collapses, squishing what would normally be one core out and because of the spinning, eventually splits into two, creates the rapidly spinning black hole pair. Now what's left after all of this is the star's outer envelope, which then starts rushing inward toward the two black holes, and it's that material that would fuel the gamma ray burst just a few tenths of a second later. Now in order to have both the gravitational wave event that was seen by LIGO and the gamma ray burst event that was seen in Fermi just a few tenths of a second later, the twin black holes would have had to have been born very close together with an initial separation of the order of the size of the Earth, and they would have merged within minutes. The newly formed single black hole then fed on the infalling material consuming up to a sun's worth of material every second and powering jets of matter that blasted outward creating the gamma ray burst a fraction of a second later. <laughs> now, I don't care who you are, that is just like downtown. Black hole dance, rotating black hole dance. <laughs> and finally, ESA's ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter and Scaparelli mission gets ready to launch later this month. The ExoMars program consists of an orbiter designed to look at Mars's atmosphere and a descent and landing demonstrator mod module known as Scaparelli. The main objectives of this mission are to search for evidence of methane and other trace gases that could be signatures of active biological or geological processes on Mars, and to test key technologies and preparations from future missions to Mars. Now, the Orbiter and Schiaparelli, which will be launched together and is currently planned for March 14, 2016, it will go out on a proton rocket and will fly to Mars at the same time. Now, by taking advantage of the positioning of Earth and Mars, which almost everybody does because you don't want to take too long to get there, this mission will take about seven months to get to Mars from Earth, with a scheduled arrival time of sometime later this year in October 2016. Now, three days before reaching the atmosphere of Mars, Schiaparelli will be ejected from the orbiter towards the red planet. Schiaparelli will then coast towards its destination and enter the Mars atmosphere at about 21,000 kilometers per hour. It will decelerate using aerobraking and a parachute, and then finally it will break with the aid of a thruster system before landing on the surface of the planet. From its coasting to Mars till its landing, Schiaparelli will communicate with the orbiter, and once it's on the surface, the communications of Schiaparelli will be supported from Mars Express and from a NASA relay orbiter. The ExoMars orbiter will then be inserted into an elliptical orbit around Mars and then sweep through the atmosphere to finally settle into a circular, approximately 400 kilometer altitude orbit, ready to conduct its scientific mission. Schiaparelli will demonstrate a range of technologies to enable a controlled landing on Mars in preparation for some of ESA's future missions. The launch of ExoMars 2016 will mark the start of a new era of Mars exploration for Europe. Later in 2018, the ExoMars mission will include a rover that will carry a drill and a suite of instruments dedicated to exobiology and geochemistry research. <laughs> I will let you know. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thank you all for watching, and thanks to all of you who support SFN on Patreon to make it better. And as always, keep looking up.